Breaking news tonight, a hit and run has police searching for the driver who hit a man in his late 50s and took off. Witnesses told officers a white pickup truck was speeding before hitting the man on Morrison near Ashley Road. That's on the city's south side. That man was taken to the hospital with critical injuries. Officers are still looking for the driver of that white pickup truck. It has been one of the hardest hit groups of businesses in San Antonio during this pandemic, but tonight a new chance for bars in Bear County. Thousands face the added cost of becoming a restaurant in order to reopen, but about 400 remain closed. So what will it take for those bars to get back in business? The night team Stephen Cavazos was there as mandatory measures were announced. We're the scapegoat for this stuff. Why, why take away our livelihood? Don Marsh says the damage is done, and he's unsure if business will ever be the same. Marsh is the owner at Bar 1919 off Alamo Street, which faced a financial setback when it had to close its stores in late March because of the pandemic. Today, Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf announced that local bars can reopen at 50% capacity, but with additional recommendations from a COVID-19 Community Response Coalition. To those bars that will not serve food, this is a... Uh, timeline and, 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 and the regulations that we'd like to see put in place. There's a total of eight recommendations, including tables must be at least six feet apart. Face coverings should be kept on even while dancing and ensuring ventilation systems work properly. Bar 19 is just one of 425 bars in Bear County that has kept its doors closed. Most of the 3000 bars in the county reopened as restaurants, but when bars do reopen, they must close by 11 p.m. Marsh says that's peak business hours for most bars. He believes it's unfair bars that are opened as restaurants can stay open later. So now we're having to catch up after not working for six months and this is what you're giving us. This is not what we want. Not all the way. David Naylor is the bar manager at the Modernist off East Grayson Street. Naylor says the last few months have been challenging, but many are doing what they can to get by. For me, it's understandable. For others, it's not. Yeah. The bar has been offering only food and beverages to go for the last several months. Tomorrow, they plan to reopen as a restaurant. Yeah. Naylor is unsure what business will be like once they do that. He says he wants bars to not only be a fun place, but a safe place. We have to pretty much maintain safety protocols, and we're going to continue that until we have to. Now, the task force did create these additional recommendations because they felt the governor's order was just not enough. Now, the judge did accept seven of those recommendations and they will go into effect. It's still not clear when bars will reopen, but the judge does anticipate as early as next week. We're live off St. Mary's Strip, Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. Steve Eses. Thank you, Stephen. Let's take a look at where we stand amid this pandemic tonight. Our seven day average down to 126. Spare County now has more than 60,000 COVID-19 cases since the pandemic started. No new deaths reported today. We did see a slight rise in hospitalizations. 193 COVID-19 patients are in the hospital. 80 are in the intensive care unit, 39 on ventilators. Coming up, Mayor Ron Nuremberg joins us live for a discussion on bars reopening in the pandemic. Coming up in our KSAT Q&A. Meantime, Northeast ISD and Northside ISD plan to allow more students to return to class on Monday. Those students must already be signed up for the second grading period. Meanwhile, South San ISD is delaying its next move in the phase in process since the COVID-19 positivity rate here in Bear County went back up above 5%. Right now, they will only allow six or seven students into each classroom. We continue to be led by the data. That's, we've always said that, and we always knew that if there was a chance that the data showed that there may be some, a higher risk, that we would adjust our schedule. Metro Health currently deems the risk to be moderate a week after it was deemed low. That's because the positive rate went from below 5% to above that benchmark in a matter of days. San Antonio ISD says it will also not allow more students in the class. They are waiting for local health data to show positivity rates of 5% or less for a two week period. And tonight we're learning USAA is now facing a hefty fine. The federal government says it must pay an $85 million civil penalty. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency says there were deficiencies that led to violations of the Military Lending Act and the Service Members Civil Relief Act. The city of San Antonio faced similar violations to that relief act in the past when vehicles of military members were wrongfully repossessed, towed, taken away. 
The city says they have taken corrective action. The OCC says USAA Federal Savings Bank is also working to fix its own violations. And we're still expecting the arrival of a cold front tomorrow afternoon, but the biggest changes temperature wise won't be happening until tomorrow night. So we'll go through this night tonight. Upper 60s near 70 degrees, and that's what we'll wake up to tomorrow morning. Cloudy sky. Watch out for areas of fog for the morning commute. I anticipate some of that, but then we'll have some sunshine by the afternoon. The cold front hits and the changes happen. Our morning temperatures will definitely take a hit with this cold front, but even more so the afternoon highs. I'll be back in a few minutes to talk about that and how we're really going to see a temperature roller coaster coming right up. Thank you, Adam. A bigger turnout at the polls today. 36,892 people waited in lines to make their voice heard at the polls. That's 3,700 more ballots than yesterday. A little more than 70,000 people have cast a ballot early, weeks ahead of the November election. We have a full list of polling locations on ksat.com. Meanwhile, around 45,000 mail-in ballots made it back to the Bear County Elections Office so far. Many are still choosing to vote in person, including those who are 65 and over. Catherine Somerville says she canceled her mail-in ballot and decided to cast her ballot in person to make sure her vote is counted in time. Others we spoke to said they felt their vote was more secure while voting in person. If you are voting by mail, you can track your ballot on Bear County's election website. We've got a night beat update now on that standoff on the city's northwest side from a couple of days ago. 32 year old George W. Schultz III is facing a charge of deadly conduct with a firearm. According to an affidavit, officers were called to an apartment complex off Milsa Drive around 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon when residents heard gunfire. That's not far from the Dominion. In that affidavit, police go on to say a woman in a neighboring apartment saw the bullet pierce through into her unit. She and her acquaintance ran to escape the gunfire. No injuries were reported. More than four hours later, that standoff came to a peaceful end with Schultz in custody. Other top stories tonight. A man stabbed in the neck and two suspects in custody. The incident happened around 7 a.m. at a Planet K tobacco shop off Goliad Road on the south side. San Antonio police say three men all stayed together overnight at a drainage ditch next to the store. So far, police have no motive, but they say one of the men stabbed the victim. He managed to, you know, walk his way to the utopia. That's not where he lives. His girlfriend's house or apartment, excuse me. And then that's when the, the girlfriend called the police saying, stating what happened. The victim was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Police say a witness helped identify two possible suspects. The men were arrested at a nearby gas station on Goliad and Southeast Military Drive. A judge called him a serial thief who targeted the elderly. When victims of Carlos Elizondo finally had their day in court, he promised to never work as a contractor again. It was a promise that went uncapped. The fact that he's out here again doing this to people, that's my main concern. The night team's Dylan Collier spoke with a new trail of alleged victims who claimed they were duped in this defender's report. Ring of the wood, there's cracks. After Lisa Fairchild hired the Alamo Fence Company to redo her backyard in June, they built a wood enclosure with visible structural issues, a back gate that kind of opens and a deck that will need to be redone. Yeah, there's several issues. Fairchild says she went to police after owner C. Renee Elizondo walked off the job without making repairs or completing the work. Fairchild's $5,400 contract with Elizondo, which she paid in full, included nearly $1,700 for new sod, none of which she's ever seen. And it just continued on the, the excuse after excuse of not showing up or are not coming to have any work done. Fairchild joins a still growing list of people who hired C. Renee Elizondo then wish they hadn't. Right around the time they also discovered his first initial stands for Carlos, as in the same Carlos Elizondo who was sentenced to four years in jail after this reporter exposed him for the exact same scheme. When prosecutors moved to revoke his probation in late 2017 in four 
theft cases, Elizondo was infamously referred to by Judge Wayne Christian as the wolf who preys on the sheep of society. You refuse to rehabilitate. During a crime spree that eventually landed him in jail, Elizondo racked up 10 theft charges in three years, including three cases that had elderly victims. He has agreed to me, he's agreed to his family that his contracting days are over. He's done being a contractor. That promise from Elizondo's attorney would turn out to be a hollow one. After serving less than a year and a half of his sentence, Elizondo got out, dropped his first name, changed the name of his company, and went back to accepting money for work that he would not finish. He put these four posts up. Elizondo charged Crystal and Damian McMillan $1,800 to build a backyard deck. But as the McMillans told Bear County Sheriff's deputies, after accepting two payments totaling 1200 bucks, Elizondo installed four posts and hasn't been seen since. I'm very angry because we work hard for our money and not just a you know, just to hand it out. A digging bar, a stack of fencing material, and an unanswered text message demanding a refund are all reminders to the couple that they hired the wrong guy. I was just in shock. I can't believe that we fell for it. This is a man who was convicted of several counts of theft, sentenced to four years in jail, only served about 14 months of that. Uh, claimed he would never work in contracting again, would never work for himself building fences, and yet he came right out of jail and went right back to it. It literally makes me sick to my stomach that I kind of got suckered into this. I, I know better than that. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. The Defenders tracked down police reports filed in recent months against Elizondo in three different jurisdictions. He has not been criminally charged since getting out of jail. Two days after we reached out to Elizondo and asked for an interview, he emailed many of his clients and wrote that he was shutting down his business. He blamed going out of business on a lumber shortage and rising costs because of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you recently hired Elizondo and had issues with his work, we want to hear from you. Please send your emails to defenders at ksat.com. You're still ahead on the night beat tonight. Wells Fargo firing more than 100 employees after an issue uncovered amid the pandemic. What an internal memo is now revealing. And the process to seat a new Supreme Court justice seems to be moving forward for now. Today's questioning on Capitol Hill and what's now expected to take place coming up. But first, the president's son now testing positive for coronavirus and one company now approved to test its COVID-19 vaccine on children. It's next on the Night Beat. As health experts warn of a surge in COVID-19 cases across much of the country, the first lady revealing her son also tested positive for the virus. Meantime, the race for a vaccine continues with one pharmaceutical company announcing it will start trials on kids. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest. As more than half the country battles a rising number of COVID-19 cases, the first lady saying, quote, my fear came true, revealing her son, 14-year-old Barron Trump, also tested positive for the virus not long after she and the president did. The announcement in a White House essay about her COVID-19 experience. Shortly after it was published, the president said this. How is Barron? Barron's fine. Melania Trump writing, luckily he is a strong teenager and exhibited no symptoms, saying he has since tested negative. The president has been seen without a mask at his campaign rallies after his own COVID-19 diagnosis, including Tuesday night in Pennsylvania, making unproven claims about immunity for those who have also contracted the virus. Well, you're the people I want to say hello to because you're right now immune. But experts warn a person's immunity after contracting COVID-19 is still unknown. At least 36 states are facing an increase in hospitalizations, 35 with a growing number of cases. Wisconsin now a hot zone for the virus. In Milwaukee, a field hospital is set up as the state sees a record number of deaths. Many of our ICUs are strained and every region of our state has one or more hospitals reporting current and imminent staff shortages. Meantime, the race for a vaccine rages on, Pfizer becoming the first approved to test its vaccine on children as young as 12. 16-year-old Caitlin Evans joining the trial in Cincinnati. 
I'm just hoping that they can use whatever they get from me and that it helps them put out a vaccine as soon as possible. More than 100 children have reportedly died from the virus and nearly 700,000 have been infected. Health experts saying as the weather gets colder and people head indoors together to celebrate the holidays, it's especially important to be mindful of family members who are at risk because of age and underlying conditions. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Take a live look outside with live cam. I spent a little bit of time outside today. It was warm. It was. Yeah, I mean, it felt okay. like summer all over again. That's what I was thinking. It was like, okay, oh it's not humid, but it's still, <laughs> it was really still warm, yeah. still yeah. running above average. And we do have some big changes coming down the pike. You're just not going to notice them right away tomorrow. By tomorrow afternoon, you'll sense the change in the air. Let's talk about high temperatures because tomorrow we'll still be right near 90 degrees. But look what happens on Friday. We go from 90 on Thursday down into the 60s for afternoon highs on Friday and Saturday. We start our rebound back into the 70s and then Sunday it's back to basically where we've been. So big temperature swing here and roller coaster ride coming down the pike. Today was actually our sixth 90 degree day in a row and that of course is above average 92 was the high today the average being 83 and we we're only three degrees shy of the record set back in 2015 right now it's still warm out there 81 dew point is 60 so a bit of humidity in the air more so than what we had earlier today and that southeasterly breeze will be really pumping up that humidity through the night it's not really overly humid along and west of I-35, but you get along the coastal plain and that's where we have the thicker humidity and this is going to take over and move westward and northwestward as we go through the night. So here's our future cast and notice how the humidity really increases with those higher dew points through the night tonight. I mean, tomorrow morning at sunrise dew points around 70, so actually pretty sticky out there and not only is it going to make it feel sticky, but I do think it's also going to contribute to some areas of fog. So we are anticipating fog tomorrow morning. The future cast shows that fog burning off probably by about anywhere from 10 a.m. to the noon hour tomorrow, but expect reduced visibilities around the morning drive in the first part of the day. All right, temperatures. 79 Carrizo Springs, but still 85 in Del Rio, 77 Gonzales, and 80 in New Braunfels. We widen out the view across the state, fairly similar readings, 79 Lubbock, Alpine at 74 along with Victoria, but we have to head farther to the north. That's where the colder air mass is that's going to be dropping into town. And currently on the cold side of that, that boundary, we've got temperatures in the 30s to 50s. So clearly a big temperature drop behind that front. It's a real deal fall cold front that's plunging southward. As for precipitation, the jet streams to the north of us, and that's basically the highway of the precip right now, and that's really not going to be pushed our way. So despite a cold front moving in and a traditional triggering mechanism for some showers, I just don't think we have a lot of moisture to really squeeze out of the clouds. So a few isolated showers and that would be it. So let's consult the future cast tomorrow morning, areas of fog and low clouds. And then by the midday, we have some sunshine early afternoon. The cold front hits along it. Maybe a sprinkle or two, especially south and east of San Antonio. And then we get into late tomorrow night into early Friday, and that's when the low clouds settle back in and we can't rule out a few spritzes and sprinkles from that. Insignificant in terms of rainfall, a trace to maybe a few hundredths of an inch here and there, and that would be it. So just slight chances of rain with this front. Tomorrow, here's your day planner. In the morning, muggy, some fog, 70 degrees at 7, at 7 a.m. Then we're up to 90 at noon, partly cloudy. So another warm day. The cold front though, you'll start to notice the effects into the afternoon. The second half of the day, windy, gusty, a wind out of the north at times in excess of 30 miles per hour. Humidity quickly falling in the afternoon and evening. And shortly after sunset, we'll see those temperatures fall off fast. I mean, we're talking 50s by Friday morning and only making it into the 60s with low clouds mm. and a few sprinkles Friday afternoon. So a true fall like day, but we rebound quickly. I mean, it's back to flip flops and oh shorts goodness, yeah. by Sunday. I mean, look at that <laughs> near 90 again and humid. All right. Thank you, Adam.
All right, COVID concerns hit big time college tonight. Greg. There is no bigger name in college football than Nick Saban, and he has now tested positive. And that has to make you wonder if other leagues, like maybe the Pac-12 and the Big Ten, are rethinking their decisions to get back in. When we come back, Nick Saban tests positive. He tells us when he was told and his reaction to that when we come back. And the Dallas Cowboys are now down six starters already this season. Coming up. The head coach of one of the most prominent college football programs in the country, Nick Saban of Alabama, has tested positive for the coronavirus, and it comes just days before the Crimson Tiders have to play their biggest game of the season against number three, Georgia. Saban has left the school after getting the news and is now self-isolating. Alabama Athletic Director Greg Byrne also tested positive for COVID-19 today. Saban, who is now 68 years old, said he was informed his team threw a Zoom call at 2 p.m. this afternoon and that offensive coordinator Steve Sarkeesian will oversee the team's preparations for Saturday night's game. As a result of Saban's positive test the school will now test everyone within the football program tomorrow here's what Saban had to say in a zoom interview tonight we test our players every day I get tested every day um, I feel fine I felt fine I was very surprised you know by this as soon as you travel you get exposed to a lot more things and a lot more people so even though I've worn a mask on the sidelines I wear a mask all the time uh, in the hotel uh, on the bus uh, in the plane. So um, I can't, nobody really knows, you know, how this occurs. Meantime, Florida's game against LSU scheduled for this Saturday in the swamp has been postponed after the Gators saw a surge in positive coronavirus tests. As many as 18 scholarship players and three walk-ons tested positive, according to Athletic Director Scott Strickland. And while he doesn't have an exact number of how many players are being isolated through contact tracing, he did say that the Gators only have 50 scholarship players available for Saturday's game. And Strickland believes that the root of the outbreak is based on Florida's trip to Texas to play A&M when a couple of players boarded the flight with an allergy-like symptom and did not tell anyone. To our knowledge, no positive tests have been revealed among the Aggie football team. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Just five games into the 2020 season, new head coach Mike McCarthy has now lost six starters, including star quarterback Dak Prescott with that compound fracture and dislocation of his right ankle. Before Dak went down Sunday, McCarthy had already lost left tackle Tyron Smith to a neck injury, right tackle Lael Collins to a hip injury, tight end Blake Jarwin, defensive tackle Gerald McCoy and Tristan Hill all to knee injuries. And there are still 11 games to play, starting with Arizona Monday night. Obviously, uh, I'm going to have to step up, um, you know, at that role um, or any role that they, they need me at, um, you know, across the D-line and, uh, you know, just go play ball. Um, you know, uh, the, the injuries have definitely hurt us. And, you know, obviously uh, the big one um, to uh, four uh, was, um, you know, devastating. And you, you hate to see it, especially to a, a man like that. Um, you know, he's a... Uh, you know, an incredible individual, you know, on and off the field. And, you know, um, it's always sad to see. After picking up their first win of the season, now the Houston Texans have to face the Titans in Tennessee this Sunday, who are still undefeated after beating the Bills 42-16 in a game that had to be played yesterday to the COVID-19 positive test on the team. It's a chance for the Texans to reunite with their former number one draft pick, Jadavian Clowney, who now is playing defensive end for the Titans. You got to control them. You got to get the ball out quick. You got to be able to, you know, do things that, that you know, the ball is out of my hands and, and getting into space. So uh, he can definitely disrupt the game. Um, I've seen him in my own eyes for two years, seeing and watching him in college um, and, and then watching him in the pros. So, yeah, he's a problem uh, for sure. Uh, so we got to make sure that we, you know, know where he is at all times. Yes, indeed. Battle of the Unbeatens and big game coverage next. One of the big games in a big game coverage this week will feature the Brennan Bears against the Reagan Rattlers in a battle of the unbeatens on Saturday night. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Brennan Bears are forced to open their season with district play in 29-6A with a pair of victories, 41-6 over Jay, 49-7 over Holmes. This will be the Bears' toughest opponent they have faced so far this season, non-district battle. That's after the Rattlers struck Steele with a 23-20 victory and a 45-7 over Clark to open their district play. We know that they have a... Uh... A, a good offense, good defense, they're, they're a good team and we're ready to kick it off and go compete. They're a fighting team. They've been good for the last few years and, you know, we've been playing them for the last few years and I know they're going to come out fighting, so we got to be on our best game. We just got to keep the momentum going and keep playing how we've been playing and 
just do what we do. They're going to play to the fourth quarter. It's going to come down to the last second of the game. All of our, we put it in our heads that we got to play to every whistle. All right, it's Brennan against Reagan at Comalander Stadium Saturday night at 7 p.m. And the Houston Astros are trying to stave off elimination in the American League Championship Series by getting out in front of Tampa Bay and staying out in front tonight. They're now leading four games for runs to two in the eighth inning. They are down, though, three games to none. So this is a must win tonight. Yeah, they do not want to get swept. No, they don't. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. It is our KSAT Q&A where we separate the facts from the fiction out there. And on Wednesdays, we are joined by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg, and we are pleased that he joins us again live tonight. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we talked about the bars reopening, the fact that early next week they'll likely get to reopen. I know that you consulted with the county judge on this. Yeah. How tough a call was this? You know, as long as we're grounding our decisions in the public health guidance and we're, we're continuing to seek their you know consultation and expertise when we make these decisions it's not hard at all uh we put politics aside and we put you know the the um the fervor of the news cycle uh on hold and we look at the facts and we seek the guidance of the medical professionals it's what we've been doing from the very start and what they have told us is that we need to focus on behaviors and not places and if we can begin to open things up in ways that uh, those particular establishments can ensure proper uh, operations and the behaviors that would be problematic that would transmit the virus can be contained, then we can do this. And we've got to do it methodically so that we can see the effects of each of these decisions. But we got good guidance from our medical professionals, our public health teams, and uh, we feel like we're, we're going to be in a good position to, to do this the right way. Of course, it takes cooperation on the part of the establishments, as well as the patrons who enjoy those places. If we do that, we can continue to open up and, and do so safely. I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about voting. Early voting started yesterday. We saw those long lines, lots of images of that. And we, as we reported, a lot of uh, other Texas cities broke records, but that wasn't necessarily the case here locally, at least yesterday. What were your impressions as early voting gets underway? You know, it's it's different because we're also in, in times of a pandemic, so there's a lot of physical distancing. So that may have contributed to some of the wait times. Uh, but we also know we had record setting mail in ballots and San Antonio probably has a higher proportion of mail in ballots, just given our um, older population and uh, our service member population. So, you know, I think it, it will show that we are going to significantly break records, especially since we have an extra week of early voting. So I'm I'm pleased. You know, I, I, I talked with many folks in line uh, yesterday and the, the optimism, the sense of, you know, hope and, and, you know, a reset for our community, for our country is is real. And I think that has shown uh, in the fact that people are waiting. They're enduring the lines, sometimes the heat to make sure that they cast their ballot and their voice is heard. I think it, it gives you great hope in our democracy and our community and certainly our country. Your name may not be on the ballot this year, this November, but you have some skin in this game when we're talking about workforce training and the proposition that you, that you have been pushing for. And just today it was announced that you made an endorsement of Gina Ortiz Jones in the Texas District 23 race. That is a rarity. Why did you decide that you wanted to weigh in in that race? You know, I don't I don't make a habit of, of endorsements, um, but, you know, I felt in this case that uh, Gina has shown that she's the right person for the job. I mean, she has a deep and abiding respect as a veteran for our service member community. She also, in my conversations with her, has a, a real uh, understanding of the needs of working families here in San Antonio uh, and the importance of education, certainly workforce development, ensuring that everybody has an equal opportunity here in our community. So uh, I've gotten to know Gina over the years. I think she's going to make a fantastic representative uh, in Congress for uh, our community here in, in, in the city. And, and it's a big district also. And I think she'll do very well uh, for a very diverse and large uh, district that means a whole lot. This is one of the, the, the highly watched uh, races in the country. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to make my feelings known uh, when when Gina asked me and and um, again, I think she's the right person. I look forward to her service.
Do you have butterflies when you think about the proposition that's going to be on the ballot? I mean, is it like your name is on the uh, on the ledger? Uh, not my name. It's the names of 150,000 people in our community that were on the brink of economic devastation before this pandemic began and now find themselves out of work, underemployed. And, and you know, it's it's the names of all of the members of our community that have struggled uh, through this pandemic and certainly those who, uh, you know, were depending on uh, help prior to the pandemic. You know, this proposition is about getting our community back on its feet and ensuring that everyone has an opportunity for a dignified life of work, uh, the skills training to uh, get jobs that are open here in our community for people. Uh, and all that is needed is uh, skills training. Um, you know, this is the difference between having to depend on uh, social assistance or being able to have a job that has a family sustaining wage. Um, to me, this is uh, a, a extremely critical for our community essay ready to work proposition B. I hope everyone votes for it uh, because the people who are, are benefiting our own neighbors, our loved ones, our friends who we've seen um, struggle and, and be devastated through this pandemic. Uh, it's not about me. It's not about any uh, member of the government. This is about our community. And that's why I urge everyone to go and vote for Prop B essay ready to work. Let's get our community back on its feet. We have a couple of minutes left in this interview, and I wanted to switch gears one more time and talk a little bit about COVID. Earlier in the show, we reported that the risk level went from low to moderate. Does that fear, scare you at all? And also, when are the, the next models due out to kind of show us where, we're, where we are and where we're headed? You know, we shouldn't fear things that we can control. And we've shown that we can control this pandemic if people do what the public health professionals have been telling us, wearing a mask, physical distancing, personal hygiene, making sure that if you are sick, stay home. Uh, those are the things that will ultimately get a grip on this pandemic and help us go back to, to you know, some sense of normalcy. Uh, so I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned in that respect. However, we are on the, the very edge of that 5% positivity rate that is critical for us to, to see the guidance from the public health professionals about in-person schooling. Uh, and so, you know, we, we volleyed under and now we're over. We've just got to continue to buckle down. And, and this underscores the fact that the virus is still out there. We've got to do our parts. If we want to make sure the business is open, if we want to make sure that schools get back to, to get back to school safely, uh, we've got to be vigilant and we've got to do our part. And that's everything that the public health professionals have been telling us from the very start of this. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg, as always, we appreciate your time and thanks for staying up late with us. Have a great evening, all. Thank you. We'll be right back. Judge Amy Coney Barrett faced another day of questioning by members of the Senate Judiciary Committee today. The high stakes marathon hearings touching on everything from health care to the possibility of a disputed election. ABC's Andrew Dimbert reports from Capitol Hill. After nearly 19 hours of questioning, lawmakers grilling of Judge Amy Coney Barrett is over. Now, senators will convene with Barrett behind closed doors to review her. You will be confirmed, God willing. You will have my full support. Republicans have spent the last few days working to establish that Judge Barrett, a protege of the late conservative justice Antonin Scalia, can separate her personal beliefs from her judicial ideologies. People say that you're a female Scalia. What would you say? If I'm confirmed, you would not be getting Justice Scalia. You would be getting Justice Barrett. For Democrats on the Hill, they wanted clarity from Barrett on key issues that could impact the lives of tens of millions of Americans, pressing President Trump's nominee on a number of topics, including the Affordable Care Act, which comes before the court one week after the election. Did you have then a general understanding that one of the president's campaign promises was to repeal the Affordable Care Act when you were nominated? I, as I said before, I'm aware that the president opposes the Affordable Care Act. Republicans seeming to emphasize severability, which if judges strike down one part of a law, then try to preserve everything else, in this case protections for pre-existing conditions and other popular parts of the ACA. The presumption is always in favor of severability. The main thing is the doctrine of severability has a pres presumption to save the statute if possible. Is that correct? That is correct. Another focus of the Democrats' inquiry in today's hearing, President Trump's sweeping claims of power. 
Would you agree first that nobody is above the law? Not the president, not you, not me. I agree, no one is above the law. Rank and file Republicans unabashedly sensing victory in Barrett's confirmation say Trump's decision to pick her for the nation's highest court was a triumph, decades in the making. This is the first time in American history that we've nominated a woman who's unashamedly pro-life and uh, embraces her faith without apology. Barrett is fully expected to get confirmed and take her seat on the bench in a couple of weeks, just days before the presidential election. Andrew Dimber, ABC News, the Capitol. Around America tonight, the Drug Enforcement Administration is announcing the largest domestic meth seizure in U.S. history. The drugs packed into duffel bags and piled high. 2,200 pounds of meth, nearly 900 pounds of cocaine, and 1,300 pounds of heroin were found smashed in several homes as part of Operation Crystal Shield. The drugs are tied to a cartel from the Mexican state of Sinaloa. The Missouri couple accused of pointing their weapons in front of protesters are pleading not guilty. Mark and Patricia McClowski say demonstrators were trespassing and making death threats while walking past their Missouri home back in June. The husband and wife were indicted on two counts of unlawful use of a weapon and tampering with evidence. There were claims a gun was inoperable because it was used as a prop. However, prosecutors say the pistol was tampered with before it was given to police. Well, the woman who made this 911 call was seen in a viral video calling police on a black man who was bird watching in Central Park. Amy Cooper, a white woman, is now facing another charge. Along with facing a charge of filing a false police report, she is facing a misdemeanor charge for another call. Prosecutors say she made the second 911 call about the encounter, repeating her false assault accusation. The May 25th incident involved a disagreement over an unleashed dog. She's heard on the video saying, quote, I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life, end quote. Wells Fargo Bank firing more than 100 employees who reportedly tried to swindle coronavirus relief money. The bank announced the move in an internal memo today. It says the employees misrepresented themselves to obtain money from a federal relief fund for small businesses. The memo says the employees may have defrauded the U.S. Small <coughs> Business Administration. However, the document says those workers acted on their own and the move did not involve Wells Fargo customers. Take another live look outside with live cam. Still kind of hazy it looks like out there. Is that, is that me? Is that the camera? Is, it, is that what it really looks like? Often it's yeah. a, that camera we have on the south side. It, yeah. it just, it always looks a little hazier than what it really is out there. I think it's part of the connection you know, that we have to the, okay. the communication say, with the just, camera. We gotta let's, fix that. Let's bring on the cold <laughs> yeah. front and just blow out all that. Yeah. Oh, we will. Oh, we <laughs> will. It, it's, this isn't going to be a long-lived cool down. So don't think that because this cold front's going to be hitting that, oh, we're out of the woods for 90 degrees and it's just going to be fall like from here on out. Now we're going to have a few days of very fall like conditions. I do want to talk about the aquifer. It took another hit today down three tenths of a foot. We're about four and a half feet below the October average. As for your pollen count, mold moderate and ragweed on the low end today. You know, I was so focused on the cold front. I really didn't pay close attention to this sunset. Usually I'm glued to this camera shot. Look at that. We actually had a really nice sunset this evening. It looked good with those high thin clouds. 66 this morning, then we topped out at 92 this afternoon. Right now, we're near 80 degrees, give or take. 76 Rio Medina and Randolph, 78 Pleasanton, 80 still in New Braunfels, Bernie area at 75. Temperatures not falling off all that quickly this evening. One reason is a resurgence of the humidity. And we're still 84 Catula and Laredo, so still warmer, especially closer to the Rio Grande. Here's the big picture, the wider view. Look at these readings in the 30s. See that bl blue color on the base map there indicating the cold, the cooler air that's plunging southward along with the cold front. That's the leading edge of it, and that cold front's going to hit us by tomorrow afternoon, but we're still going to have a warm day tomorrow. The effects of the cold front will mostly be felt on Friday and even into Saturday. There's some shower activity on the backside of that front, and I really don't anticipate much in our neck of the woods in terms of rainfall, maybe a 
stray shower or a few sprinkles here and there. Our future cast, I like how it displays this. Tomorrow morning, low clouds and fog, so anticipate reduced visibility for the morning commute. Then we get into the afternoon, we have some sunshine. If we're lucky, we'll ring out a shower or two from the clouds as the cold front moves in. But by and large, it's going to be a dry frontal passage behind the front into Friday. Low clouds dominating the sky and with those low clouds, the chance of a few hit or miss highly isolated showers, but we're not expecting much, if anything, in terms of accumulation. So tomorrow's still a warm day. We'll start at 70 with the low clouds and fog by the noon hour up to 90 degrees and still humid, then the cold front hits and you'll really notice the wind picking up right when that front hits. The wind's going to be gusting out of the north and I think we'll see some gusts in the 30 to 40 mile per hour range for the second half of the day tomorrow. So tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening, if you have any sporting events outdoors or you're just getting outside, do anticipate a strong north wind and then temperatures fall off into the 50s by Friday morning and look at Friday afternoon, low clouds, a sprinkle or two, only 67 degrees. So we're going from flip flops to jeans and long sleeves there, just like that. But you know, by Sunday, sunny near 90. Oh, and humid again, and it's going to stick around for a while. Who am I kidding? I'm still going to have flip flops on. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yeah, come on. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Still ahead on the night beat, Disney is changing its focus as the pandemic poses a problem for profits. The new strategy coming up. With a range of cars to choose from, is there one that can check all the boxes? 12 on your side shows us what cars are most likely to make you happy. And Sesame Street is launching a new podcast. We have all the info for parents next on the Night Beat. Yeah, there's definitely been a rush for gamers to try and get their hands on a new PlayStation 5, the PS5. Pre-orders wrapped up rapidly, and now one fast food chain teaming up with Sony for an insider contest. Burger King offering customers a chance to win one of these. It starts up tomorrow, has 1,000 consoles up for grabs. There's a major overhaul coming to ABC's parent company, Disney. More focus now being placed on Disney+. Plus. Disney investor Trip Miller says these changes will produce, quote, higher quality content, end quote. Miller adds this move will allow Disney to possibly recoup some revenue that was lost in its other divisions. Along with parks being shut down, the pandemic also hurt Disney's profits by postponing films and productions. Well, you won't have to travel far to get to Sesame Street. Apparently, it's as easy as going to Audible. That's where you'll find the Sesame Street podcast with Foley and Friends. Foley is a fuzzy purple monster and the newest neighbor on Sesame Street, and she'll be hosting the show. Elmo, Big Bird, and Cookie Monster will also be making an appearance. The stream starts tomorrow with 15-minute episodes. Well, can a car make you happy? Maybe, but will the same car that sparks joy for you be the same for your spouse or your grandmother or your friend who lives far away? 12 on Your Side's Marilyn Moritz reveals which cars are most likely to leave us satisfied. After collecting data on more than 400,000 vehicles, Consumer Report says it knows what cars are most likely to make you happy. Well, we know this because we asked CR members whether they would buy the same car again, and their answer is the basis for Consumer Report's owner satisfaction score. We then look at how owners rate their cars on satisfaction in five different categories, driving experience, comfort, value, styling, and dashboard controls. Owner satisfaction is an individual thing, but they found some trends. For example, women were most satisfied by the Kia Telluride, Mazda MX-5 Miata, and Ford Expedition, while men preferred the Tesla Model S and Hyundai Santa Fe. What about where you live? Folks in the Midwest were happiest with the Chevy Bolt. For the South, it's the Ford Expedition. Tesla Model S in the West and Toyota Avalon in the North. As for age, millennials like the Subaru Ascent, Gen X the Tesla Model S, boomers are likely to be happy with a Ford Expedition, and the silent generation loves the Genesis G90. But the car that pleases everybody in every category, the Tesla Model 3. Cars that inspire the greatest loyalty among consumers are ones that are fun to drive, reliable, deliver great fuel economy, or can be driven solely on electricity, 
or provide a high-tech, luxurious driving experience. They also found the more you spend on a car, the more likely you are to be happy with it. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Well, a discovery made on the sand. The boat uncovered 27 years after it was launched to sea, and the story it holds is coming up next. All right, check this out. A Minnesota couple found a small wooden boat at a remote beach near Lake Superior. <laughs> On the bottom, a message that read, I am traveling to the ocean. Please put me back in the water. There was also an address to a classroom across the shore in Duluth. The address was to Bonnie Fritch and Brenda Shell's second grade class at Lakewood Elementary in 1993. Brenda had a friend who made the boat and we had her class paint them. And then at the end of the year, we would take a field trip and we went to the Brighton Beach and we let the boats go with their class. The class was learning about currents and the connection between the Great Lakes and the ocean. Fritch says that this is actually the second time the boat has been found and now released back into the water. Fritch says the idea that inspired the boat project came from the book called Paddle to the Sea. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm, very neat. Yeah, and Lake Superior, not necessarily a calm lake most of the time either. No. I mean, it can, it can be pretty rough out there. You can get waves up to 40 feet, I've seen uh, reported there. Anyway, tomorrow, 90 degrees, then the cold front hits. Friday will be cloudy, cooler only in the 60s, and then Saturday, what a day. Saturday, will sunrise will be about 53, and then by the afternoon, oh, just upper 70s and sunny. How's that? That's it for the night beat GMSA at 4.30. Good night.